virtually and, and talk about a topic that hopefully will be of interest to everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Fiscus, and, and before I go into too much detail and jump into it, uh, I just want to point out a couple of the features of the interface that we have here. Um, so you should be able to see sort of the control panel for uh, our, our um, event this evening. And in that control panel, I would point out that there's both a chat section as well as a question section. Um, I absolutely encourage you at any point in time in this process to enter things into the chat window uh, or enter things into uh, the question window and I will do my best to answer them as quickly as possible. Um, I also want to point out that um, a little while later on uh, as we uh, get through this, um, this uh, webinar, you will be presented in the chat window with a link to complete an evaluation form. Now, if you are familiar with SANS, you know that we absolutely love, we eat, sleep, live, and die by evaluation forms. So I would ask you if you would be so kind as to uh, complete that. It's very short, but we definitely would love to get any feedback you have uh, on the topic, on, on the event, on, on everything that's going on, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so as I mentioned, my name is Kevin Fiscus. I'm a principal instructor with the SANS Institute. I primarily teach um, the Security 504, which is Hacker Techniques, Exploits, and Incident Handling, uh, and the Security 560, which is um, Network Penetration Testing and Ethical Hacking. Uh, in addition to my work with SANS, I'm also the founder and lead consultant for uh, Cyber Defense Advisors. And with Cyber Defense Advisors, I do penetration testing, risk assessments, regulatory compliance gap analysis. I help people develop their policies, incident handling process, and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and I also have uh, another company called Deceptive Defense, which focuses on helping organizations design and implement cyber deception strategies. Um, I've been in the IT industry for about 30 years. Uh, I've been in uh, the information security industry, per se, for uh, about 19 years. And with the whole kind of being quarantined at home, I feel like that's the amount of time that I've been stuck in my basement. Um, so um, also uh, very relevant to this particular conversation, um, I'm also the lead author for an upcoming SANS class, which will be the Security 550 uh, Cyber Deception, uh, Deception Attack Detection and Disruption. Uh, and we'll get into that one in just a second. Uh, I maintain a bunch of different security certifications. I think I have 12 or 13 GX certifications, uh, including the GX Security Expert, uh, and I'm also certified as a cyber guardian for both red team and blue team. Uh, so just a little bit of background. Um, this particular um, uh, event that we're in the part of, um, what, what we're actually doing uh, as part of this is this is actually a, a very short preview of that new class that I mentioned. Uh, in fact, what I've literally done is I've just pulled out the first module of the first day of that class um, so that you guys can get a feel. It, it's a it's a very self-contained module, so we are going to be covering uh, a complete set of topics, but you'll also get a little bit of a feel for what this whole cyber deception class is going to be like. Um, so it's a bit of an advertisement for an up-and-coming class, but uh, I, I think you'll find that the content stands on its own, and you'll walk away from uh, walk away from here with some actual useful things that you could do tomorrow in your environment with respect to cyber deception. So let's just jump straight on into it. Uh, again, as a reminder, questions, comments, any of those types of things are more than welcome. So please feel free to drop those either in the questions window or the chat window. So let's talk about the state we are in today. And I'm going to reference two different industry standards or industry standards, uh, industry surveys or studies, right? One of those um, is published every year by FireEye slash Mandiant, and it's what they call their M-Trends report. The other one is a report put out every year by the Ponemon Institute uh, that they call their cost of a data breach study. Now, according to the M-Trends report, um, when they talk about, so I want to focus on something that they refer to as dwell time. How long do bad guys stay on our networks before they are uh, initially caught? And at least for the 2020 report, now this report is based on 
investigations conducted by FireEye slash Mandiant between October 1st of 2018 um, through um, September 30th of 2019. So we've got a year's worth of, uh, of results in there. And what they state is that the median dwell time is 56 days. So uh, just what does that mean? Well, what that means is 50% of their, um, their clients um, they basically were able to detect the bad guys in less than 56 days and 50% of their clients, they were, it took them longer than 56 days. Now that's a very generic number. And it turns out that whether those breaches are, uh, internally uh, discovered or externally discovered has a huge impact in the amount of time it takes. Internal breaches or it, breaches discovered internally are typically discovered, uh, median dwell time is about 30 days and external breaches, it jumps all the way up to 141 days, right? Um, so those are some big numbers, right? 56 days is the better part of two months, right? Bad guys are on our network for two months before we know them. Now, if we look at the Ponemon Institute cost of a data breach study, they actually talk about what they call the mean time to identify and the mean time to contain. Mean time to identify is effectively the same statistic as dwell time, right? Um, and it turns out in 2018, last year, it was 197 days. This year for 2000, or for you know, the last re uh, report, 2019 report, it was uh, 206 days. So it's actually gotten worse uh, according to the Ponemon Institute cost of a data breach study. Weirdly enough, uh, if you look at the M Trends report, that number has actually decreased. So for those or organizations that uh, are customers of FireEye, that number has gone down, whereas kind of globally, uh, that number has gone up. Now, the mean time to contain is once we detect the attack, how long does it take for us to effectively respond to that? And for the 2019 Ponemon Institute cost of a data breach report, that was 73 days. Whereas in 2018, it was 69 days. So again, we are getting worse in this process. Now, as we look at this, um, again, I'm now referencing the Ponemon Institute 2019 cost of a data breach study. Uh, it turns out that the average cost of a data breach is $3.92 million, which to be honest with you is a remarkably useless figure, right? Because let's face it, organizations aren't average. An individual organization isn't just an average. So if I said the average data breach costs $3.92 million, well, how does that compare with my organization? Is my organization bigger than average? Is it smaller than average? Whatever. Um, well, it turns out that they've also broken those numbers down by industry or by vertical. So if you look at it, um, we can see that, for example, health, uh, uh, like if you're in the health industry, the medical industry, um, your average cost of a data breach is actually $6.45 million. Whereas if you're in the public sector, it's only $1.29 million. So again, you can kind of get some additional detail by looking at the, the details of the, uh, of the report, but it's still, if you're a big hospital versus a small hospital. So I find the, the data point that is perhaps the most interesting has to do with the cost per compromised record. And for the 2019 Ponemon Institute cost of a data breach study, that number is $150. Uh, it was actually, I think, $147 or $146 last year. So if you think about it, if you happen to have a database of 1,000 records and that database were to be compromised, you can assume that that breach is going to cost you in the ballpark of $150,000. Now, as we look at all of this, there's a couple of reasons for looking at all these statistics. Um, on one hand, it, it's, it's you know, good eye candy, it's good filler, uh, but at the same point in time, it also is really useful when we security people try to talk to our bosses and our bosses' bosses, when we try to talk to business people, because we can't start talking all kinds of techno nerdy uh, things. What we actually have to do is we have to put our messaging in terms that are gonna be meaningful to those business people. And by applying metrics and case studies and things like that, that really does help. So there's more reasons though, than just giving you some interesting statistics to take to your boss. Um, one of the big reasons why we bring this up has to do with the, the juxtaposition of the relationship 
of the time it takes to detect and contain a breach and the cost of that breach. And according to the Ponemon Institute study, there is a direct and proportional relationship to um, the time it takes to detect and contain a breach and the cost of that breach. Um, so if we look at it and we say, okay, if we are able to detect and contain a breach in less than 200 days, in 2019, that data breach is going to end up costing us $4.56 million. Um, or sorry, if it, if it takes greater, I've got a, a, a typo in here, I just noticed. If it's greater than 200 days, it's going to be $4.56 million. If it's less than 200 days, it's going to be $3.34 million. So there's over a million dollar difference or a 36.5% increase if we take longer over 200 days versus less than 200 days. What does this mean to us? Why, why are we talking about this? Well, if we are in the world of information security, what that means is our job is to try to reduce risk to an acceptable level. And risk can be defined as the likelihood that a threat exploits a vulnerability causing some level of harm. So when we try to manage risk, right, there's not that much we can do about the threats, right? They exist outside of our control. We can try to address the vulnerabilities, which is what the vast majority of our security programs are all about, patching, hardening, all that kind of fun stuff. But we've also seen over the last three decades or so that we cannot eliminate vulnerabilities from our environments. So what else can we do? right? We can attempt to reduce the harm. And by reducing the harm, we reduce the risk. So if we look at this and put this entire equation together, if the cost of a data breach is increased as the time it takes to detect the breach goes up, one of the ways we can reduce the cost of a data breach is to detect these breaches more quickly. Uh, and that's part of the reason, and we're going to look at some ways that we can actually do that in a very, very practical way as we go through there. Um, the fact of the matter is, we absolutely have a problem. And let's face it, if you look at the Ponemon Institute study, it's not been getting any better. Now, I do occasionally get asked, Kevin, why is there a massive difference between the M-Trends report from FireEye and the Ponemon study? And I don't have an absolute answer for that, but I have some guesses. And it really boils down to, I believe, that people who are clients of FireEye slash Mandiant tend to have more mature security programs than the average random organization. So what we're saying is, I guess if you, if you juxtapose those two things, those organizations that have a good security program are actually getting better, but everybody else is actually getting worse. Uh, in terms of detecting and responding to these attacks. So the fact of the matter is we need to change the game. The question then becomes, how do we do that? Well, one of the ways that we can do that is we can look outside the world of information security at the military. Uh, and we're going to talk about something called an OODA loop. Now, OODA is an acronym that is short for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. It was coined by United States Air Force Colonel John Boyd, and he was basically talking about it in the context of fighter pilots. What he basically said was, if you are a fighter pilot and you get involved in a dogfight with another fighter pilot, the first pilot that manages to observe the situation, right? They take in all of the input. They orient themselves to the situation. They take their experience, they take their capabilities, all that kind of stuff, and wrap it around the, the, the situation. They make a decision about what they're going to do, and then they act on that decision. Whoever does that, has the, the likelihood is they fly home. Um, the person who does that slower, I guess best case scenario, they're probably taking a long, slow parachute ride to the ground. Now, the question that is very justifiable, justifiable at this point is, what in the world does some fighter pilot acronym have to do with computer security? Well, in order to answer that, I am not going to talk about computer security. What I'm going to talk about is your home, right? What I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes and think about your home. Now, it's kind of weird because 
when I, you know, six months ago, were I to give this talk, I would probably make some joke about the fact that I can barely remember my home because I travel so much. Well, I think that probably all of us are getting very up close and personal with our homes these days, um, more so than before. Uh, so I want you to think about your home. Imagine it's four o'clock in the morning, right? And you hear a sound. Now that sound could be your cat jumping off the refrigerator. It could be your kid getting up to use the restroom in the middle of the night. It could be that creaky heater that you have or whatever, but you know those sounds. Those are normal sounds in your environment. What if it's not normal, right? What if you hear something and it's abnormal? Now this could be something really obvious like breaking glass, uh, or it could be something less obvious, but you know normal. And the fact is, you're in your home, you know normal. So if that, that unusual sound were to happen, you're going to have a pretty easy job of trying to figure out where that sound came from, maybe what it is, and you're going to be able to formulate a plan. Now, if it turns out that that noise is a bad guy, right? It's somebody who has broken into your house. Well, the fact of the matter is that bad guy most likely doesn't know your house, right? They don't know the layout. They don't know where the rooms are. They don't know what rooms are occupied. They have to figure all of that out. So the bad guy is in this observe and orient mode as they try to invade your house. Now, because they don't know your house, as they start trying to maneuver through your house in the dark of night, they bump into a table, they knock over a lamp, they step on a kid's toy, they step on that squeaky floorboard in the hall, whatever it boils down to, um, they're going to alert you to the fact that they're there, predominantly because they're fumbling their way around trying to observe and orient themselves to your house. You, on the other hand, have a detailed knowledge of your home. You know exactly what's where. And so when you hear that strange noise, you can observe, right? I heard the strange noise. You can orient yourself to that strange noise, which is basically where did it come from? What do we think it is? What does it sound like? All that kind of stuff. You can then develop a plan for how you're going to interact or respond to that. Are you going to call the police? Are you going to get a weapon? Are you going to sneak out the back door? Are you going to go collect your kids? Whatever it is that you are going to do, the fact of the matter is you will likely win that scenario if you make good decisions because you have observed, oriented, decided, and act first before the attacker even gets to the point of being able to fully observe. Now, this doesn't mean you're guaranteed to win. It just gives you a significant advantage. So when we are in familiar environments, when we're in our environments, um, what that means is that we have an advantage when it comes to our OODA loop, when it comes to complete, completing that. So this then brings up a, a really kind of uncomfortable question, right? If we have an advantage completing the OODA loop in our home territory, why in the world is it that we don't detect bad guys for months in many cases, and that often we end up being notified by a third party not detecting it on our own, right? Why do we fail to complete that OODA loop first? And the answer is simple and complex at the same point in time. The fact of the matter is, if we were truly familiar with our own networks, we would have a significant advantage here. But if you go and you ask 100 organizations, what percentage of your traffic is TCP? What percentage is UDP? What percentage is ICMP? How many nodes do you have on your network? What are the used IP addresses on your network? What are the used MAC addresses or valid MAC addresses on the network? A lot of organizations cannot answer those questions. Uh, and that becomes a significant problem. Um, as we go and look for, uh, for a lot of this stuff. So because we don't know our own environments, we put ourselves at a bit of disadvantage. Now, there are other reasons why we end up failing, uh, which we'll get into in just a little bit. Now, the fact of the matter is, 
we should do a better job than we do. We have budgets, right? We may not have all the budget that we want, but we typically have more budgets than the bad guys do. We have budgets, we have personnel, we have technology, we have people, we have all this stuff, right? Firewalls and IDS and web filtering and mail filtering and strong authentication and all these, you know, network access control and antivirus and so on and so forth. We have tons of technology. So what the heck is going on? Why in the world are we losing as badly as we are? And um, one of the ways that we can look at this, and this is actually a, um, so uh, there's a, an author, uh, a guy by the name of Barton Whaley, and he's a, a noted author, author on deception, primarily talking about military deception. Uh, and in one of his books, I don't remember which one it was off the top of my head. Uh, I think it was his book, uh, Practice to Deceive, um, he stated, in combat, deception can strengthen the weaker side. When all other factors are equal, the more deceptive player or team will always win. Now, what does that have to do with us? Well, it has to do with us because the bad guys use deception. Almost every attack that we run into uh, launched by a bad guy has some sort of deceptive capability built into it. Whether the bad guy is trying to evade antivirus, um, evade IDS, evade DLP solutions, things like that. Uh, they may be trying to bypass network access control, 802.1x, those types of things, circumventing other types of controls. Um, they cover their tracks by deploying root kits, uh, or they just simply do sort of a live off the land type of thing uh, by using built in normal, uh, normal appearing tools and technologies. They use deception. Consider like a phishing email, right? A phishing email is straight up deception. Now, the problem with all of this is most of our detection technology today uh, involves looking for evil, right? We're looking for some symptom of evil or some sign that evil is happening on our network. And so in order to circumvent that, the attackers simply need to make themselves appear not evil. They don't need to appear good, they just need to appear not evil. And they have a ton of different ways to employ deception to make that uh, actually happen. So my contention is we need to change how we do detection. Instead of looking for evil, what we should be trying to do is trying to look for abnormal. Now, there's a whole line of security technology that's often like user and entity behavioral analysis and things like that, um, that attempt to do exactly that, right? They're going to try to normalize a network and then identify deviations from normal. Now, I'll, in honesty, the example that I used to give as to why this is so difficult is, right, it may be normal for Bob in accounting to log in between the hours of 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. It may be very abnormal for Bob in accounting to log in at four o'clock in the morning. So if Bob logs in at four o'clock in the morning, you raise an alert and say, oops, this abnormal activity is happening. Well, what happens if Bob travels overseas for business? Well, then he's going to take an abnormal action that is entirely normal given the context. Another way of looking at this is, well, let's face it, a gigantic number of us are now working from home where we've never done that before. That changes the complexion of what normal looks like in our networks. Um, and any kind of massive shift in how we do business, the deployment of new applications, the deployment of new business functions is going to change what that normal actually looks like. So what, what we talk about with deception is instead of trying to normalize an entire network, what we're going to do is we are going to place resources in our environment. Now those resources could be anything from a, I mean, it could be a full blown network. It could be a host, it could be network traffic. It could be uh, a file, it could be credentials. It could be a service or a port or anything like that. We're gonna place resources on our network that has or that have no other business function. And as a result, absolutely nobody should be interacting with those resources. That in turn allow us to define normal as no interaction at all. 
So if anybody does happen to interact with those resources, it is by definition abnormal and therefore it is actionable. It's something that we can go take a look at. And that at its heart is the core of cyber deception, at least from a detection perspective, right? And these are not new concepts at all, right? Um, in this case, I, I like to look, go back into history and kind of see where things stand. Um, this is a quote from a guy named uh, General Archibald Wavell. Um, and what he said is perhaps the most elementary principle of deception is to attract the enemy's attention to what you wish him to see and distract his attention from what you, what you wish him not to see. That's kind of the, what we're talking about, right? I don't want the bad guys interacting with my production resources. So I'm going to distract them. I'm going to attract their attention to my fake, my fictional, my deceptive resources, right? Um, another way of looking at this, um, this one's actually from a book called Triple. Now, uh, Triple is a book by Kevin Follett, and it kind of talks about um, a, 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 an espionage um, activity that was done um, back in the, uh, in the 70s. Uh, but what's really important about here is he talks about this concept of something called a telltale. And a telltale is basically that trap or that trigger, that thing that allows us to, to know that something's going on. He says there were dozens of ways of planting telltales. A hair lightly struck across the crack of a door was the most simple. A scrap of paper dram jammed uh, uh, against the back of, uh, back of a drawer would fall out when the drawer was opened. A lump of sugar under a thick carpet would be silently crushed by footsteps. A penny behind the lining of a suitcase lid would slide from front to back if the lid were open. I love this particular quote because it kind of highlights what we're trying to do. We're trying to plant the pennies in the back of the suitcases. We're trying to put the hairs across the, the door jam. You know, we're trying to do subtle things so that if we detect that that particular telltale has been manipulated, we know that something's going on. So let's look at how we can actually do this. Um, so we're going to start off with using a very simple tool called Netcat. Now, if you haven't played with Netcat before, uh, there are variants of it for Windows and Linux and Mac and all that. It comes with Nmap in the form of Ncat, uh, but it's basically a socket creation tool. It allows you to set up a listener on, uh, on a host, on a, on, a, on a system. And so in this case, what we're saying here is NC. Uh, so in a Windows computer, we might do something like NC-V. Dash V says, be verbose. Tell me when a connection happens. Dash capital L on listener says, set or on, on Windows says, set up a persistent listener. Uh, listen for mul you know, uh, multiple connections. And in this case, dash P80 basically says, we're going to listen on port 80. Now, the Linux syntax is similar. Um, it should be noted that not every variant of Netcat for Linux supports, uh, in this case, we have dash K which is a, um, a persistent listener. Not every version of Netcat for Linux supports dash K. If it doesn't support dash K, you can accomplish the same thing uh, using something like a while loop or something like that. But the key here is I now have port 80 listening on my laptop, for example. Nobody should ever be connecting up to port 80 on my laptop. If somebody does, the dash V will let me know what their IP address is. And now I know that something suspicious is going on. That's a super, super, super simple way of doing maybe so, uh, some basic deception. And because I'm now alerted to the bad guy on my network, or at least some suspicious uh, activity, I can begin and hopefully end my OODA loop before the bad guy gains a foothold in my network, and I can go ahead and stop them, or before they move or do too much harm, that type of thing. Now, this is super, super, super simple. Let's actually kind of expand upon this a little bit more, because I may not want to just sit there and stare at my computer screen waiting for an alert in a terminal window. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to create a little bash uh, script. Um, so what's going on here 
is we're also going to be using Netcat, but we're going to be doing something a little bit special with Netcat. So let's walk through this entire syntax or the majority of this syntax as we go through there. So the first thing that we're going to do is use the exec. Um, um, it, it's a it's what's called a bash built-in. So it's a built-in command in the bash shell, and it deals with redirecting input and output. Okay. Um, so again we're redirecting input and output as we go through this entire scenario. So we've got our exec, then we've got our one greater than, greater than, logger, all that kind of stuff. So the one greater than, greater than, what we're basically doing is we are trying to take standard out um, from one command and feed it into another command. This is kind of the effect of piping the output of one command into another command, right? So we've got our exec, exec, then we've got a little quotes uh, we, we've got this whole logger thing, but at the very end of it, we have two is greater than ampersand one. Well, what that's doing is it's basically saying take standard out and direct it to the same place that we are redirecting standard uh, out. So we're taking standard error. I'm sorry, I might have misspoken. So we're taking standard error and redirecting it to the same place that we redirected standard out. Now, this is kind of super important from a netcat perspective in particular. Because Netcat, when data comes across a Netcat connection, that data is sent to standard out, right? So whatever the, the bad guy sends to my computer in this context gets sent to standard out. Now, any Netcat generated messages like, hey, there's a connection, those get sent to standard error. So what we're basically doing is taking any data coming from the attacker and any Netcat generated messages and sending them somewhere. Now, where we're sending them is to the logger function. Now, the logger function is basically going to take something and write it to syslog, right? Now, when we write it to syslog, um, we've got a couple of syntax here. So the dash s, dash s says, take standard out. Well, we're, we're redirecting standard out and we're redirecting standard error basically redirecting them into this logger function. But what we're also doing is we're echoing standard out to the terminal window. So we have a, a visual thing going on in the terminal window that this script is running into. The dash T says when we write something to syslog, we're going to tag that message with the file name of the script. So when we made this script and we called it something like, I don't know, netcat logger or something like that, then our syslog messages are going to contain that netcat logger in their, in their message. So that's what that base name thing is all doing. So effectively what we're doing is we're taking any error or any, we're taking any netcat generated messages and we're taking any data that came from the attacker and we're basically sending it to syslog with a tag of the name of the script. And then the next line of it is basically the nc-l listen-v be verbose dash k persistently listen on port 80. So effectively this is, I can set this up anywhere in my environment that I want. Uh, I, you know, obviously this is gonna be Linux focused. Um, there are some variations you might be able to do with PowerShell and things like that. But what we're basically doing is we can set this up on any Linux box that we want or a virtual machine or even a Docker instance, something like that. Um, and we now have, a, a, you know, one or more open ports throughout our environment. Now, because these ports aren't actually associated with an actual service, there's no real foothold that the attacker is going to get based on this. Um, so there's very low risk, very low cost. It's very easy to do. And we can throw these things up our, all over our environment. And if anybody interacts with these, when, it, when, when they complete their three-way handshake, uh, what's going to end up happening is we're going to get a syslog alert, hopefully maybe some centralized syslog server. So that's one approach that you can take with that basic netcat thing. Uh, another approach that we can take is uh, this sort of monstrosity. So as we go through this, what we're trying to do here is we're using a while loop to create some persistence. So a while loop is simply a conditionally evaluated loop where we're checking to find out if a condition is true. If the condition is true, we do what's stated in the loop. So now let's walk through this and see what's actually going on. So the first thing we have in there is while one. While one is an always true statement, it's a tautology. So what we're saying there is while one always will evaluate to true, so this loop will always repeat when it ends. Now the next thing we have in there is date colon echo started. 
what we're basically doing is just spitting out the date and time as well as the word started to standard out. We're just it, it, having a visual representation in the terminal window that something is going on. All right, so then we're gonna do do. So do is where we start what's gonna happen within this loop. But what we're doing here is we're saying do IP equals, and then we have a tick mark. Now that's not a single quote, it's actually a tick mark. On a, on a, on a US keyboard, it's the unshifted tilde. So what we're basically saying is everything in between the tick marks is going to generate an output and that output is gonna be placed in the variable called IP. All right. So now we're gonna put something in IP. Well, what is that going to be? Well, we're gonna start off a netcat listener, we're gonna be verbose, and we're gonna list it on port 80, right? Then what we're gonna do is we're going to redirect standard error to standard out. In other words, if there are any uh, netcat generated messages, we are gonna send those to standard out so we can interact with them. What we're also gonna do is with the one greater than slash dev slash null, we're actually going to throw away any, uh, you know, any data that comes across that connection. So anything that normally would have been sent to standard out is getting thrown away, and we're going to redirect standard error to standard out. Now, standard error in this case, in most cases, is simply going to be that we got a connection from a particular IP address. So the next thing that we're going to do is use this grep from. So we're going to pipe the output of all of that into a grep statement, and we're going to look for from. So effectively, we're taking the netcat generated messages that have been redirected to standard out, and we are looking for the word from, because the word from will exist in any, in any connections. Then what we're going to do is use the cut command, and we're going to use a delimiter of a, an open bracket. So we're going we're gonna to use open brackets as delimiters, and we're going to pull out the third field in that output. Now, that third field is going to contain the IP address of the computer that just connected up to my system. We then have to get rid of some extra garbage on the end. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the cut command again with a delimiter of a close bracket, and we're going to pull out the first field. And then we end with our tick mark and a semicolon. So the output of all this is simply going to be the IP address of the computer that just connected up to my system. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run an IP tables command. I'm going to add an input rule. I'm going, the protocol that I'm going to be focused on is TCP. The source address, what do I want to, what do I want to look at from a source address is that IP variable that came out of the previous command. And we're going to drop that. So effectively what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up a port. If anybody connects up to that port on that system, we are then going to create an IP tables rule on that system and block their address. Now this could work really, really well. So the first option that we did was focused primarily on detection, whereas the second option is focused on detection and then subsequent automatic blocking. Um, the way that I might play this is, I might put the detection method on non-critical assets or even fake systems. And then I might put the blocking piece on critical assets. If somebody tries to connect up to a weird port, an unnecessary port on a mission critical system, maybe I don't wanna talk to that person anymore. So we'll go ahead and block those. Now, obviously you could take this as far as you want. You could integrate this concept with uh, you know, network firewalls or that kind of stuff uh, as you feel necessary. And those aren't the only things we could do, right? Uh, another example, I know uh, as a pen tester that one of the things that I want to do as an attacker and that a lot of attackers want to be able to do is when they compromise a computer, uh, oftentimes a Windows computer, they want to query memory. They want to interact with memory on that Windows computer computer to try to pull out password hashes or potentially even clear text credentials. I know that the bad guys are going to do that, so I'm going to account for that as we move forward. So there's a couple ways. So the concept here is I'm going to place credentials in memory on production systems. Now there's a lot of variations of this uh, should you wanna do it, but here's a, a, a kind of simplified concept, right? Imagine that I created in my Active Directory environment a whole bunch of 
effectively fake user accounts, non non used user accounts. Now, I take those user accounts and I plant credentials for one of those fake user account uh, accounts on each system in my environment or each laptop or whatever I'm concerned with. So effectively, I'm putting credentials for those fake accounts in memory on those Windows computers. Now, the credentials that are in memory are going to be slightly easier to crack than my regular production credentials. Um, and they are going to be incorrect. They are not going to be the right credentials for those particular users. I'm also going to use um, fine-grained um, uh, password policies in Active Directory for those users. And for those and only those users, I'm going to set up um, account lockout after one failed login attempt. So effectively, bad guy compromises a computer. They interrogate memory, they pull credentials out of memory, they crack the, the password, and they attempt to use that password. The first time they use it, that account will get locked out. I, as the defender, will get an alert that the account was locked out. And because I know which accounts or which, which credentials were placed on which systems, I also know exactly what system that bad guy has compromised. And that's a tremendously powerful tool to be able to effectively detect and respond. And we are by no, uh, by no respect done, right? Um, one example is uh, web attacks, right? Bad guys love attacking web pages. Well, what if I put um, on my website web pages that have common names but aren't linked by anything. So I might do a www.something.com slash admin or slash security or slash HR or something along those lines. There are no links to those resources at all, but a lot of times attackers will try to use techniques like Durbuster to try to find those unlinked pages. If anybody goes to those pages, it's suspicious. I could even drive the attacker to those pages by placing those pages in the robots.txt file uh, as a disallowed entry. Now, that's going to make sure that Google and Yahoo and, and Bing and those guys don't index those special attack pages. But bad guys will often look at the robots.txt file as a first place to look. Where does this, you know, where do the people who run this website not want me to go? Well, if they don't want me to go to slash admin, that's exactly where I want to go. Fake login portals can allow us to uh, trick a, an attacker into disclosing some credentials that they might have. Um, I could create a fake Facebook profile about a fake employee that talks about fake technology. And so if the bad guys are conducting reconnaissance, um, they might learn that we have this specific technology in the environment. Yes, it is fake, but the bad guys don't know that. So I can use that to set an expectation on the part of the attacker. And then if I present them with something that matches that expectation, they're not likely to be suspicious. Uh, renaming the administrator account and then creating a fake administrator account. Really simple, but if anybody ever tries to log in with the quote unquote administrator account, uh, that would generate an alert. Fake documents, uh, employee payroll, that kind of stuff. Um, usually what I would do with this one is I would create a fake user profile on a system and drop those fake documents on the in the My Documents or Downloads or Desktop of those fake users so that the real users don't have to trip over that stuff. We can, of course, uh, do something like the Netcat that we talked about before, deceptive services, open ports. We can create fake systems. We can create fake networks, fake network traffic. Um, we can even do things like, hey, let's call all of our systems scary sounding things, right? IDS, IPS, whatever. Uh, even if we don't have those technologies, we could pretend that we do. And the fact of the matter is, this is the tip of the iceberg, right? Creativity can lead to just about anything that you would be interested in, in going ahead and looking at doing. Now, part of all of this is trying, you know, what, what we're trying to do with this whole process is we're trying to disrupt the attack. Uh, what we're seeing here is actually a, um, a bit of a, uh, a kind of a summary of what's, what's referred to as the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. 
Uh, we're going to dig into this a little bit more later. But what we're saying is, generally speaking, what the bad guys do is they go through some sort of reconnaissance. They then, based on the results of the reconnaissance, they weaponize their attack. They create their malware. They create their exploit code. They then deliver it. They launch their exploit. They then gain access. They install themselves on the system. They then establish command and control. And then they take whatever follow-up action that they're going to do, moving throughout the network, exfiltrating data, whatever. So the whole concept here is that if we can break this chain or this, um, this, this cyber kill chain, we can uh, disrupt the attack. So when they're doing reconnaissance, we lie to the attackers. When they're trying to do their weaponization, they're then doing it against uh, or using faulty assumptions. Uh, when they try to deliver their attacks, we redirect them to fake systems. Uh, when they try to actually launch the exploit, we might even lie to them and tell them that it worked when it didn't or lie to them and tell them that it didn't work when it did, right? Um, we can obfuscate what we're looking at, all kinds of cool stuff. So what we're trying to do is understand what the attackers do and then disrupt what they're doing. Now, when we start talking about these deceptive systems, I have oftentimes said the word fake. Now, I really don't like the word fake in this context because fake implies not real. And these, these systems are real. They just have a specific intent. So a lot of military deception uses the term notional, right? According to the Webster's Dictionary, notional is existing in mind only or imaginary, which doesn't really apply much better than fake. But I like to use it because it is commonly used in sort of military context when you start talking about deception as well. So if I talk about notional systems, what I'm talking about are those deceptive or those fake systems that we're using to trap or uh, manipulate the behavior of attackers. So as we go through here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to plant those uh, lamps, those child's toys, and those squeaky floorboards that we talked about before. We're trying to place those traps. Now, the cool thing is that all this deception stuff plays absolutely perfectly with every single other security technology that you already have in your environment. It is not a replacement for any other security technologies that you have. And in fact, those security technologies that you already have can make deception even better. Um, the example that I always give is um, in the conflict in, the, in Vietnam, right, in the late 60s and early 70s, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong would place what are called punji stakes uh, in the ground. They would bury, make these pits in the ground. They would put like sharpened bamboo stakes in there. And the intent was that as the, as the enemy stepped in those, uh, those holes, they would impale their feet and um, they would be uh, in, incapacitated. And the advantage of doing that is that if you can incapacitate rather than kill somebody, other people need to help that person out. So you take more than one person out of the fight. Well, they didn't place these punji stakes everywhere what they did is they placed them in trails in the jungle because they assumed that their adversary was going to be using those trails uh, the jungle effectively limited the freedom of movement of uh, the 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 adversary well the traditional security controls that we have in place the patching the hardening the ids the antivirus all that stuff that serves to reduce the freedom of movement of the attacker. So we only really need to focus our deception on those areas where the bad guys can still go, right? Um, now, obviously there's gonna be some redundancy and stuff like that, but what we're trying to do is create a comprehensive picture that uh, is presented to the attackers that then directs them to take specific action. As we do this, we do need to understand what our goals and objectives are, right? What do we want to do, right? If, if it turns out that there's a bad guy on our network, uh, quite a lot of organizations default to this, uh, I call it the SWAT the mos mosquito mentality. The SWAT the mosquito mentality, you know, if you get bit by a mosquito, you immediately slap that mosquito. You don't want it to be a threat in the future. And a lot of people treat attackers as mosquitoes, right? Uh, we detect a bad guy on our network, we knock them off of our network. The problem with that is all the attacker needs to do 
is change their IP address and then come back with slightly different tactics. Uh, now, it might be the right thing to do to knock them off the network. If they are actively engaging in some harmful activity that's going to damage you, yeah, knock them off your network. But what if they're just interacting with notional systems? You have their IP address, which is actionable threat intelligence, and you can watch what they do. Um, you can collect additional threat intelligence as they continue to interact with your environment. And if they get too close to something that you care about, you can then knock them off the network. And let's face it, organizations spend good money paying for threat intelligence services to give them threat intelligence. And those things are never going to be specific to an individual attack or specific to your individual environment. They might be specific to your industry, things like that. But what we have when we detect the attacker is specific threat intelligence. And a lot of times that's very, very valuable. We don't necessarily want to burn that right away. Now, when it comes to deception, lots and lots of benefits. As we talked about before, they can be, deception can be incredibly easy to set up. Um, it is highly scalable and it is proportionally scalable to environment size. If you're a tiny environment, you can deploy deception. If you're a gigantic complex environment, you can deploy deception. Now, obviously the tiny environment's gonna be easier and the complex environment's gonna be harder to do that throughout, but it is pretty proportional with the size of the environment, right? Um, this is also a fairly low maintenance and very, very low false positive type of a solution. Uh, I remember the very first presentation that I saw on a deception technology, the vendor actually showed me their interface where all the alerts would show up and they said something that was absolutely shocking. They said, when you look at this interface, you should never see anything. If you see something, it's actionable and you need to attack or uh, you, know, you need to uh, investigate or whatever. Um, I think that's huge, right? Because so much of our detection time today is spent tweaking, tuning, adjusting, modifying, and trying to manage our detective, tune, tweak, all that kind of stuff, our detective solutions. Um, very low maintenance and extremely low false positives. It allows us to detect the bad guys on the network significantly more quickly. I think one study that I talked about, a 91% reduction in the time it takes to detect and respond to bad guys when cyber deception is used. That is enormous, 91% as we go through there. Now, yeah, there are, could still be false positives, right? The security people did a port scan or a vulnerability scan, but those things are gonna be also very, very easy to uncover as we go through there. Now, when we talk about implementing deception, there's kind of a general process that we're gonna to wanna to follow. The first thing we need to do is understand something about normal in our environment. When we deploy deception, we do not want the deception to be obvious. We want it to look normal to the attacker. So the deceptive systems or the notional resources need to look as much like the real resources as possible. Well, in order to do that, we need to understand our environments, not just in terms of the technology, but things like naming conventions, IP addressing, and even the number type and severity of vulnerabilities. So we need to understand normal. Then we also need to understand where our sensitive data is. Uh, we talked before about how deception is trying to divert attention away from what we don't want the attacker to see and direct them to what we do want them to see. Well, in order to do that, we need to know where the stuff is that we don't want them to see. And we need to know what the stuff is that we don't want them to see so we can create replicas or notional copies of that uh, that, that look realistic. Now, once we understand our environment, understand our resources, we also need to understand something about what the bad guys do. Now, we're gonna talk more about that in a little while, but there's lots of ways to do that. That Lockheed Martin um, um, cyber kill chain is one option or one model you can use. There's something called a unified kill chain. Um, MITRE has created something uh, called their attack matrix, uh, or you could simply uh, do your own penetration testing, get trained on hacker techniques, exploits, uh, penetration testing. The more you know about what the bad guy is going to do, the better off you're going to be.
You then need to identify your deceptive goals. What are you trying to accomplish? Detection, threat intel, uh, attribution. Are you trying to prosecute? Are you trying to deter? Well, once you identify all that, then you go through design and test your program. Now, as we do this, um, one of the things that's very, very common that we say is this aspect of defenders need to be right 100% of the time, whereas attackers only need to be right once. Now, we can argue about the specifics of that statement, but what it really boils down to is attackers can afford to make mistakes. It doesn't hurt them that much. But defenders, mistakes cost us a lot, a lot more significantly. Well, if you think about it, if we have now placed deceptive resources throughout our environment, such that if the attacker interacts with any of those resources, um, we get an alert. The attacker can miss most of them. They can fail to interact with most of them. But the fact of the matter is, if they interact with one of them, the defenders win. So in other words, we are taking a paradigm of defenders need to be right 100% of the time while attackers need to be right once and flipping it on its head. With deception, we create an environment where attackers now need to be right 100% of the time and defenders only need to be right once. And that is a massive, massive game changer, right? Um, this is, of course, you know, deception, as I said before, does work very well with existing security controls, but it does not require existing security controls, right? You can do this in small scale. You can do this in large scale. Um, I mean, let's face it. If you were to go in, you know, if you were to implement tomorrow that simple Netcat listener concept, maybe just putting a Netcat listener up allows you to detect the bad guy that otherwise would have gone undetected for some prolonged period of time. And the fact of the matter is, if you can pull that off, that is a gigantic, enormous win. Now, of course, there are much more robust solutions out there. There are commercial solutions out there if you're interested in all that. Um, but the concepts of deception are super, 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 super powerful. Now, um, what I'm going to do, um, I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of a heads up and kind of what the rest of the class would be. So this was actually the first module of the first day of the class. where We talk about understanding the problems. We're also going to spend a lot of time on, on the first day talking about hacker techniques, control evasion. How do you do deception wrong and how do you do it right? Then we're going to spend time talking about concepts, technologies, planning, design, incident response over the next uh, couple of days. Uh, and then finish things up with our capstone exercise. So I'm going to wrap things up real quick with just a, a, a couple of last thoughts. Uh, Sun Tzu, it is said that if you know your enemies and you know yourself, you will not be imperiled in 100 battles. If you do not know your enemies but do know yourself, you will win one and lose one. If you do not know your enemies nor yourself, you will be imperiled in every single battle. Um, I love that in that it kind of talks to, we need to know our own environments and we need to have knowledge of our attackers if we're gonna be successful. Uh, the other one, the crux of military operations lies in the pretense of accommodating oneself to the design of the enemy. There's a lot packed into a very small sentence. We know what our adversaries want to do. What we are gonna do with deception is we are going to give them exactly what they want, or at least that's what we're going to make it seem like. In reality, we're painting a picture that is in line with their expectations, but that gives us a tremendous advantage. Uh, I'm just gonna pop up real quick. I just want, and, and we're kind of running out of time here as well. So I just wanted to show you, I mentioned the um, Lockheed Martin attack matrix, the cyber kill chain, which we talked about before. Uh, this is actually the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chains. So we've actually mentioned that before. This is the MITRE's attack matrix where they try to look at what the bad guys do and look at the techniques that they use to make that happen. And this is actually the unified kill chain. Uh, in the class, we go into this stuff in a little bit more detail, but just because we're a little bit running out of time at this point in time, I'm gonna start drawing things to a close here and open up to any questions that you may have uh, as we go through uh, this process. And if you'll bear with me in just a second, 
Uh, I'm actually going to, one of the things that I neglected to do here is pop my contact information. So I'm gonna do that real quick. But if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to post them on there. Uh, just give me one second as I, I'm gonna pop my, uh, my uh, email address up uh, on here. Uh, if you do, it's gonna be uh, super not, uh, not fancy or whatever, but kfiscus at sands.org. If you have questions, if you're interested in this deception stuff, if you wanna find that information about the upcoming class, uh, if you wanna just chat about the deception stuff, feel free to, to hit me up. Um, also, uh, uh, at Kevin B. Fiscus on Twitter, uh, if you want to, uh, to find me there as well. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. So um, that said, um, that brings me to the end of my cyber deception discussion today. Um, and like I said, um, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to enter them in either the chat window or the question window. If you want to take a question offline or if you want to have a more detailed conversation or anything like that, do not hesitate to, uh, to shoot me an email as well. I am absolutely happy to do that. Um, as I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm just kind of stalling. Um, if I do see any questions, I'll absolutely answer them. Please, 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 please take a minute and go up. Uh, you'll see one of the first comments in the chat window that Carol posted there is a tiny URL link for the evaluations for this. I desperately want your feedback. Like I said, this is designed to be sort of the first module of a class that's coming out. What do you think? Tell me the good, tell me the bad, tell me the ugly. Um, I would love to get that that feedback. Thank you for Carol for, for reposting that as well. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, depending upon where you are, I'm on the East Coast, so it's now 9.30 at night. Uh, taking time out of your, you know, your days, your schedules and all that to join me for this discussion is super, super, super appreciated. So I really, really appreciate that. And uh, that said, I will then bring this to a close. I don't see any questions and all that. So if you do want to shoot me, uh, hit me, uh, hit me up with any questions or whatever, feel free to do that. Um, we are recording this presentation, uh, so there will be a link to that. If you go into the webinars thing on the SANS website, you'll be able to get a recording of this as well, should you want to. If you just want a copy of uh, uh, of the slide deck, um, feel free to shoot me a note, and, and, and we can uh, we can go through some of that stuff as well. Um, so that said, thank you guys so much. It's been an absolutely awesome uh, evening. I greatly appreciate you guys uh, joining me for this one and uh, hope to see you at some point in time in the future. Um, and uh, again, best of luck to you all as we um, just experience together this whole craziness with the whole uh, COVID-19 stuff and all that. I hope every one of you is doing well throughout this. Um, if you're not, you know, heck, talk to your friends, reach out. It's really easy to get isolated. Um, so again, hit me up if you want to. I mean, you don't know me from Adam, but, uh, but I'm around. So have yourselves an awesome night. I appreciate you, uh, you know, joining me for this, uh, this talk on cyber deception. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.